Welcome, everyone. My name is Ben Marshall. I am the uh, SOA's staff actuary for Canada. I'm also the, uh, the staff leader for our international ambassador program, uh, where we try and develop uh, actuarial communities in developing countries. And so I have been with the SOA for about seven years. And uh, prior to coming on staff, I was uh, chief financial officer of two different insurance companies. And uh, also for about 10 years, I was a VP of risk and capital management at uh, Canada's largest bank, Royal Bank of Canada. So I've got lots of experiences uh, and I interact with a lot of different people to be able to share more than just my own perspective, uh, especially here in Canada. So that's pretty much it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, so let's get started with, I think, a question that a lot of folks have. You know, why should Canadian students consider, sorry, one second, someone just put the transcript on, apologies. Um, why should Canadian students consider continuing on with the SOA to get their actuarial credentials? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, the SOA is the, the largest uh, actuarial organization in the world. We have about 32, 33,000 members globally. We have about uh, 5,000, 5,200 of those in Canada. Uh, so it's uh, the most widely recognized uh, global actuarial organization. But here in Canada, we have a long history of uh, educating uh, and providing services for actuarial students and, and practicing actuaries going back uh, actually to the late 1800s, uh, but continuing on through today. And about 16% uh, of the SOA's membership is in Canada. So that's the second largest uh, concentration. We also have uh, Canada-specific um, actuarial education uh, in, in collaboration with our Canadian constituency. We have a fellowship track that has Canadian exams. Um, and then just uh, as far as that global um, uh, impact, uh, we do have a, a competitive advantage with, with employers. That is, if you get, S, if you write SOA exams uh, early in your career, as you're getting started, uh, employers often look to have a, uh, uh, to have, ex uh, they, they look to hire students that have demonstrated their capabilities through writing a SOA exams. Um, and in doing so, you're, you're demonstrating success against the global pool of candidates and not just local candidates in your, in your local university program. So it's, um, the SOA provides a strong value proposition. In addition, like I highly recommend that, uh, that people who intend to stay in Canada, we do have a lot of international students in Canada, some of whom do not stay in Canada, but uh, for those who either international students who stay in Canada or students who were born and raised in Canada and intend to stay in Canada. Uh, I, I always recommend getting dual credentials uh, through both the SOA and the CIA, the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. So there's um, a, a lot to be said for um, starting your career and, and pursuing a credential uh, through the SOA uh, here in Canada. Um, we, we do also, I'll just give a quick plug here. We have a great uh, new program called our Affiliate Membership Program. And that's not just for Canada. Uh, it's global, but uh, it, it affords uh, students, even those who haven't written any exams yet, a lot of opportunities for mentorships, for networking, for free events. And it's a great way to, to start your career and uh, get support from the SOA in doing so. Thank you so much, Ben. As you see, I already dropped the affiliate membership um, link in the chat because I was getting ready to do that as you were talking. Huh? <laughs> Thank you for clicking that ahead of time. Um, and you touched on something that we've gotten a lot of questions on in these answers from an actuary sessions in the past. And that is um, for international folks, is it possible to get sponsorship um, through an actuarial position in Canada? Yes, and we most of the university programs here have uh, what we call co-op programs in Canada. Often they're referred to as internships in the U.S. and elsewhere. But uh, uh, so we have uh, several really strong co-op programs, uh, and uh, students working or 
being educated in Canada who are international students are eligible for those uh, types of roles. Now, in, in terms of taking on a like uh, long-term residency in Canada or you know moving towards citizenship in Canada, um, we there is a separate like immigration process that needs to take place and and we actually are looking later this year to provide some uh, student information for international students uh, coming to Canada uh, through a webinar that we're planning to uh, offer insights into that kind of longer term stay and uh, addressing issues uh, related to immigration and staying in Canada if they so desire. That is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, I know we've got some folks coming in. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. Ben, I'm trying to pull up um, my email. There was someone who emailed me questions that they're not able to attend, but they'll be watching the webinar um, after the fact. So that is what I'm trying to pull up right now so we can get some of those answered. But Ben, you know, you are an FSA, you've taken a lot of exams. Do you have any advice for folks who are writing exams for the first time? Sure, yeah, and this comes not just from me because I it's been a long time since I wrote my exams, um, but I also work with a lot of actuaries. Um, we have about 80 volunteers that I've taken on a university outreach tour. I, I say I've taken, they are lo local to so I've done an out, a university outreach tour in Canada for with 14 different universities. We've got more coming up and are revisiting some in the fall. Um, so I use panels of actuaries who are, some of whom are younger, some older, very diverse by practice area, employer, demographic background. And so I get insights from people who are much closer to the exams. Uh, that, but some things transcend time, others uh, do not. And so I'm speaking not just from my own experience, but um, but in terms of uh, tips for actuarial students first starting to write exams, um, one, one thing is uh, for the early exams is it's always, always important to do lots of practice exams. And that is not just, um, you know, for, uh, well, doing the practice exams, you need to have a strong grip on, on the content itself. So study, whether it's through your actuarial courses or independent study, it's always important to learn the materials first. But then when you are doing practice exams, you, you're testing yourself not only for your knowledge of the content, but also it's important to do some timed ones because that time limit on writing the exams becomes crucial. And uh, so getting that, building your confidence and your skills in not just the, the material itself, but in the test-taking skill of writing quickly uh, and, and answering problems, uh, solving problems quickly. Uh, one other thing related to that is a lot of students who are writing their actual exams um, are, are perfectionists. And I, I know I had to overcome this as a, um, as a student, like you always, you, you kind of, you, you see a problem, you think to yourself, oh, I know how to do this. And so if you've got, you know, 90, sorry, 30 questions and 90 minutes to answer then I'm just, I'm just taking a, a you know, random uh, sort of, uh, example. But if you have 30 questions, 90 minutes, that means three minutes per question. If you get to, you know, three minutes on your problem and you're still like really hung up, you got to let go because if you spend six minutes on that problem, even though you know how to do it, like you're going to not have time to finish the exam. So it's, it's important to let go and not be a perfectionist, but, uh, uh, you know, maybe come back to it later if you do have time, but don't rob yourself of the opportunity to answer all the questions because they're, you will you might miss some questions that would be a lot easier for you later on just because you didn't have enough time. So. Thank you so much. For that. 
Um, our next question is from an attendee. Any advice for an ASA that recently immigrated to Canada, whether to postpone taking exams, um, I'm assuming the FSA exams, until having a job? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and it, it, it really kind of depends. Uh, with an employer, you will get study time, you will get, or at least a traditional employer. In the non-traditional jobs, you may not, but, um, but you also, they will also pay for the exams. And for the later exams, that can be quite expensive. Uh, but I, but if you choose not to do it simply because you're worried about having too many exams before getting a job, uh, I would say, you know, if you've got the time and the money and the uh, ability to put forth the effort to, to do well on a fellowship exam without being employed yet, go ahead and do it. It's not, uh, you know, having too many exams is really not a major issue um, with most employers. Uh, but if it's if it's a matter of, you know, you want to wait and get experience that accompanies it and you want to have the employer pay for the exams and get study time from the employer, then I'd say wait. So it's a kind of one way or the other, depending on your situation and circumstances. Not a one one size fits all approach. Right. All right. We have another question from Justin. Is there a possibility for a three to five uh, for someone with three to five years of experience as an actuary to relocate to Canada? Seems like there aren't uh, many openings recently for someone three to five years po um, post. And Justin, if you could clarify post um, exams, post ASA, that might be able to help. Yeah, well, I can start on the question without the clarification and we can see. Um, but um, so the, the, the supply and demand for actuaries um, is in Canada is um, it's, a, it's in flux. Um, there was a point where people early in their career that the supply exceeded the demand. And uh, so it was harder to get a, an entry level or even three to five years out role in Canada. Now, companies will have a preference for people who are already in Canada because in order to bring somebody to Canada for a role, they have to demonstrate that, that somebody who's either a citizen or landed immigrant in Canada is not available for that job. So they have to sponsor them. That's time consuming and it's expensive. So uh, there are some roles for which that will take place, but it's usually senior roles and, uh, you know, like uh, 10 years uh, of experience and like a VP type of role, they, they will take the time and money needed to sponsor someone. But unless there is a short supply at the three to five year level, uh, it's it's probably a difficult call for most employers to bring someone in. Now, what you might do is look to get hired. If, if you are in a country in which some of the bigger uh, multinational companies here in Canada have operations. So like a Manulife or a Sun Life, and you're located in, in Asia where you could, uh, or, or other uh, locations where these Canadian multinational companies have operations, you get hired there, work for them there. And if you want to come to Canada uh, and you've demonstrated yourself as an employee and they value you, then that, that, that's another opportunity to relocate just through the employer, but having been hired uh, elsewhere. So hopefully that uh, helps to address the, the question. Yes, I believe so. And um, Justin is just clarifying that they meant position, not Three to five years post something. Um, let's see. Okay, we have a question from Jeremiah about um, <clears throat> potential scholarships for students to study abroad in Canada. Um, ben, I know that might be more of a university specific. That's question. yeah, yeah. You would need to contact the specific universities in which uh, which you're interested in. Uh, we have about twenty four or so. Canadian universities that have actuarial programs. We have eight CAE schools in Canada. CAE is the, the I mean, the Center for Actuarial Excellence. Uh, and that is a program uh, that um, the SOA has globally. And we have a strong concentration of CAE schools 
in Canada. So uh, yeah, I see Brianna's putting a, a note in the uh, um, in the chat box uh, showing a link to the Canadian universities. So um, again, we we have the eight CA schools. Those would be uh, Waterloo, Laurier, UQAM, University of Quebec at Montreal, um, Concordia, Simon Fraser. University of Manitoba, University of Toronto, Western University in London, Ontario. I think I've covered all eight there, but anyway, you can use the link. And those are all highly recognized schools, but we have some great UCAP schools. UCAP means universities and colleges with actuarial programs here in Canada. And we have some, some terrific ones that are not CA schools, but still you get a great uh, actuarial education here in Canada. But the scholarships would be by uh, university rather than uh, specifically from the SOA. All right. Um, in Canada specifically, Ben, is the demand for life actuaries at the ASA level comparable to PNC, the demand for PNC actuaries? Yeah. So I don't have any recent survey data, but I do have a lot of anecdotal data. Um, and uh, it's been typically harder for PNC companies to get the to get uh, uh, PNC actuaries or actual students. So uh, my sense is that the demand is higher than the supply, more so in the PNC industry. I will also mention as a plug for the SOA that uh, with the new, uh, well, the, the SOA has a, a general insurance or PNC insurance program. Uh, and as does the, the CAS, the Casualty Actuarial Society, which is a is a fine organization, but uh, until recently, the uh, the SOA's uh, general insurance program was was not accredited in Canada. But through the restructuring of the, uh, it, it has been in the U.S. Uh, through the NAIC, but in Canada, uh, students had to exclusively go through the CAS to get uh, PNC accreditation with the CIA, the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, and that's no longer the case. With the restructuring of the CIA's education system, uh, getting a credential with the SOA and doing general insurance with the SOA is perfectly acceptable uh, as a path, one of the pathways to getting your FCIA credential. So hopefully that's helpful. So what does um, having the FSA allow you to do compared to having just an ASA? And is there a value proposition in the AF and the FSA if your path follows more of a business or finance role? Sure. And that, uh, I think that's not a Canadian specific question, but it's relevant in Canada and I can help to answer it. Uh, the FSA, um, certainly if you're wanting to be fully recognized as an as an actuary in Canada, uh, you have to get an FCIA, which uh, there are three routes to go to that, and I won't go through all three of the routes, but one of them is through an SOA, FSA credential. You cannot get fully accredited as an actuary and be eligible for things like signing uh, regulatory statements of actuarial opinion and, that, and whatnot in Canada without the FSA. Now, that said, uh, I mentioned that I'm also the staff leader for our international ambassador program and uh, in developing countries. And in many developing countries, um, the, uh, the, F, the, the ASA is, is you know, fully, uh, is far enough to go. And, and the content beyond the associateship level uh, is really actuarial in nature. It's geared toward regulatory environment, taxation, whatnot. So if you're going to practice in, a, in let's say, the insurance industry or a traditional actuarial role, uh, you know, the, the FSA gets you really into the, the specifics of fulfilling those roles. If you're working in business and finance uh, and not in a fully, you know, full-fledged actuarial role, you know, it's, it may be that the ASA is sufficient, but there is a value proposition, certainly if you're wanting to work in the insurance industry or pension industry or, or, or traditional areas of practice. Uh, if you're not planning on functioning in a traditional role, but more of a non-traditional role, then perhaps the, the ASA is sufficient for you. 
Thanks, Ben. And I um, messaged you, Ben, with the questions from our absent participant who had some. And I think following along that line, talking about the FSA, um, so they said that they plan to specialize in group and health, and they're interested to know what you specialized in. Oh, sure. Uh, so I, uh, early part of my career, I was mainly functioning in the life insurance industry. Um, when I went to Royal Bank of Canada, um, I moved into both investments and enterprise risk management. And uh, I, I mentioned that my role was as VP of risk risk and capital management. And uh, in that role, I worked with corporate treasury, trying to optimize the allocation of capital between the bank and insurance companies. I had to learn a lot about banking. Uh, and I do think there's a really great role, non-traditional role for actuaries working in banking in things like capital modeling and in things like credit risk analysis. You can apply actuarial techniques to credit risk, uh, just like you can to mortality or morbidity or other uh, specific uh, decrements uh, uh, in the actuarial uh, modeling process. So anyway, that's, uh, but yeah, ER, I would say, and then as CFO of a couple of different insurance companies, I had to learn a lot about accounting. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's run the gamut, but uh, the, the, probably the main area I have no experience in, but a lot of uh, happenstance type of learning through the SOA would be in the PNC insurance side. I had to learn about pensions at, uh, in, a, in my roles as the CFO because I was responsible for the oversight of the pension plan of the, the two companies for which I worked. So, um, yeah. I know we have a lot of questions in here. So um, one more I wanted to um, ask from the person who I do see is actually in the room now. So feel free to ask any other questions, but how do you keep your knowledge relevant now that you have your, your fellowship? So I do a lot of uh, CPD uh, work with the SOA, both in terms of creating CPD content and attending. And one nice uh, side benefit of working for the SOA is I get to attend SOA events free of charge. So I, uh, I've tuned into about um, two dozen uh, SOA webcasts a year. Um, and I go to the SOA annual meeting, but I also go to local club events and Canadian Institute of Actuaries events. I do a lot of reading uh, as, as well. Uh, one of the neat things about my role with the SOA is that it's geographic in nature rather than pra practice specific. So I need to know a little bit about everything and a lot about some things and then how to find out or you know hook up with the right people on, on different things. So I, I deliberately uh, do a lot of professional development that's outside of my preferred area of practice in, in investments in ERM. So I, I, I try to learn a lot about other areas of practice because I need to know in order to refer the, the, the constituency we have with our members and candidates. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Back to Canada specific, it looks like now, um, or maybe not actually. That's okay. Okay, I'm a recently graduated student, finished two exams, and work in a consulting advisory firm. It seems like staying where I am will be quite lonely. Should I move to a larger, more well-known company, such as the big insurers? And will that day-to-day -day include more collaboration and socialization? Yeah, so that's, that's a harder question to answer now in kind of the post-COVID environment, uh, because uh, it used to be that uh, you could rely, especially as a younger person, I do recommend being in the office and learning from others face-to-face uh, -face as much as possible when you're early in your career. And that, uh, you know, some of the companies are going back to the workplace and they're in force, uh, but some are, you still would have uh, remote work regardless of whether you're with an insurance company or a consulting firm. Um, but just reading the or you know kind of reading between the lines it sounds like you're not getting the type of development that you need as a young actuary and i'd say uh first and foremost you should talk to somebody at your firm about that and see if it can happen and they maybe they're just not aware of the need or or you know something could be done but um if it doesn't work there then Often the, the larger company environments, you know, there's more people, um, more, more opportunities for interaction. 
However, you won't get as broad an exposure. You'll, you'll get to interact with more people, but the content in the larger companies for, especially at entry level, tends to be very specialized and very narrow. Whereas working with a smaller company or a consulting firm, you'll get a, a wider variety of projects to work on and uh, things to learn. So it, there's a balance there. But if you, I get that you're not uh, getting interaction. So I'd seek that, but start with the company you're with and see if it can happen, if, especially if you're enjoying the work itself. Thanks. We have two questions um, about getting uh, finding employment in Canada as an actuary without having Canadian experience. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's also going to be a function of supply and demand. Um, it's usually if the you know two equal candidates, one has Canadian experience and one does not, they'll go with the one with Canadian experience. Although at the you know at the very entry level and especially for co-op terms, then you know that's not necessary. But the way the question is posed, it sounds like you've got some experience that it's just not Canadian. I wouldn't say that's a killer, but it it will be a disadvantage when compared to someone with Canadian experience. Um, yeah. So next question: What are some possible employers in Canada for actuaries outside of insurance and banking sectors? Yeah, so there's a there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, pensions is one, but that's a traditional area. In terms of non-traditional uh, roles, um, we've got people working in climate change, um, like for say the the disclosures needed on the investment markets by big insurance companies, so like utility companies and whatnot. Uh, so so that would be an option. Uh, we've got some working on infrastructure uh, modeling. We've got some working in the oil and gas sector. Um, but, you know, the, the nature of actual insurance and banking are an obvious candidate. Other roles, the non-traditional roles, are going to be ones where they're assessing financial risk uh, based on future contingent events, and that you know that could be, as I said, climate change. It could be the infrastructure. It could be, uh, but but there are other areas. It's just um, uh, you know it's applying actuarial techniques or learning or skills um, can a, can a, can go across a wide array. But I will tell you what's one one thing that's interesting to me is we have uh, within Canada like. 560 employers that employ actuaries and about two thirds of those, there's one one actuary or one SOA member that's in that company. That tells me that there's, you know, 360 or so actuaries in Canada working in non-traditional roles, because if you're in a traditional financial organization, there's not going to be just one actuary. There's going to be multiple actuaries. So. All right. So an actuarial student here, what roles can actuaries work in in investment banking? Uh, so that's a good one. Like I worked for Royal Bank of Canada. They've got an investment banking operation. Um, th there is a related to deals that are done in investment banking. There's always modeling work that's going on. So if you're just talking strictly about applying actuarial skills, it would almost certainly be in the modeling area of an investment banking firm. If you're look, talking about having, you know, the intelligence of an actuary and some of the insights of an actuary, but also being willing to be involved in the deal making and, you know, relationship development and uh, communications, uh, then there are roles that actuaries could take on in investment banking as investment bankers. But if, again, if you're talking just strictly the actuarial training, uh, it would be more the modeling departments or the or the risk management departments or audit departments that, that uh, assess the risks, the model risk associated with, you know, errors in modeling or, or modeling techniques. Awesome. Okay. So this person is from Hong Kong and they've obtained an open work permit, so they don't need employer sponsorship to come to Canada. 
They'd like to ask if there are opportunities in the pension or life insurance for someone with three years of experience and on track to obtain their FSA, and if the competition is very fierce, which you've already touched on <laughs> in some of your past answers. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that um, they're in a position to start talking to recruiters, start talking to employers. Most of the bigger employers will actually list their roles available on their websites so on the career section. I'd go and you know click on them. But um, I, I don't see any, that, that sounds like you're in a good position. At least you don't have to worry about being sponsored. But um, the, 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 the reason it's kind of a moving target right now is that right now we're just in the implementation phase of IFRS 17. And many of the employers had to staff up tremendously for uh, implementing IFRS 17. But now that it's in kind of the introduction, it's the first year of reporting, there some of them are somewhat hesitant to continue building up. So it would be more of a matter of replacing people. And uh, so that build, like three years ago, as IFRS 17 was be you know, development was being enacted, uh, it was a good time to, to seek employment in Canada because Canada reports under IFRS 17 and many of the U.S. companies do not. So um, that was a, yeah, an era where the supply was not as good as the demand at that level. Uh, we're entering kind of a more of a, you know, uh, plateau phase at that level because of the um, emergence of IFRS 17 and many of the insurance, you know, all insurance companies in Canada have to comply with it, but, but the buildup has kind of toned down. Sounds would you advise a European actuary to pursue the SOA exams? Would it be useful to gain more employment opportunities in Europe or North America? And have you met any European expats in Canada? Yeah, certainly lots of European expats in Canada. Um, the SOA, again, it depends on where you want to practice. Uh, the SOA is not as big in Europe as it is in Asia and North America, and now even Middle East and Africa. Um, but uh, by the same token, it is recognized in in Europe. But so, but if say you were in the UK, uh, practice and we're going to stay in the UK and practicing as an actuary in the UK, I would say you'd probably want to do a fellowship uh, with the uh, Institute and Faculty of Actuaries in, in the UK. Uh, or if you're in Germany and going to stay in Germany, you'd probably want to do a credential with the DAV. Uh, but if you're mobile and you're looking to practice in Canada or, you know, have mobility outside of Europe, then, then well, the IFO would give that to you. I'm not sure that whether the DAV would uh, or other, you know, like the French Institute. There's a different credentialing technique you know, anyway with, with France. But bottom line is if you're mobile and you're wanting to practice as an actuary and have, you know, global mobility, the SOA is a good route to go. Thank you. So this next question is, what are the most required programming skills for actuaries in Canada? And I would um, follow up that, Ben, with all of your work with the universities in Canada, what are some of those programming skills that those students are learning? Yeah, so, I mean, there's the old style skills of visual basic and, um, you know, like programming attached to software packages that, that actuaries typically use, like Excel. Uh, but now with the emergence of AI and, and machine learning, uh, so programming packages like R uh, are, are highly useful. Uh, I would say with, um, with uh, universities you mentioned in particular that it'll depend on the program. And it all, yeah, because some actuaries are and some actual programs are ensconced in the business department and others in the math department. And it'll vary depending on that, as well as the, the particular degree you're pursuing. So, um, I, yeah, I, and then one software, if you're in a traditional actuarial role, one software package that all insurance, almost all insurance companies in, in Canada would use uh, would be the AXIS um, actuarial modeling system. It's produced by uh, Moody's Analytics, uh, used to be GGY here in Canada. It's a Canadian company or 
Canadian op was originally a Canadian company. Now it's a Canadian operation of, of Moody's. But uh, you'd, you'd want to eventually learn how to use uh, access. Awesome, thanks. So this is a, a subjective question. What's the best area of specialization for an actuary? I would say, uh, I, I'm going to have a flip that answer on its head, and I would say it's best not to specialize too much. Um, throughout your career, you will fulfill a lot of different roles. I've not met an actuary like in the second half of their career that is still involved in what they started out in, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. So um, I would say being a lifelong learner and being adaptable and flexible and agile is probably more important than being a real specialist uh, in one particular area. So we have one last question. Um, and I'm not an actuary, so Ben, do you want to read this one? Not really. <laughs> sure. Does ISR, IFRI certificate program, is it required by insurers in Canada for IFRS 17 roles? No, it is not required. Uh, it is highly recognized and many employers I've spoken with highly value it because it's an exhaustive certificate program. Uh, and it's not just valued here in Canada, but uh, but globally for those uh, countries and companies that uh, are governed by IFRS 17. So uh, it's there are a lot of sources of IFRS 17 training, uh, but most of them are one off like a, a webcast or a two hour or half a day seminar. Whereas the SOA's certificate program is one that uh, is exhaustive end to end for IFRS 17. It's uh, a six module course that's that covers just virtually everything you'll need to know in relation. And it's very practical. Uh, but as that said, I would not recommend it for students who are still writing their actuarial exams. And I know this, this webcast is mostly students that are writing their actuarial exams. That's something you would do post uh, uh, post-credential. Awesome, Ben. Well, thank you so much. We've gone nine minutes over. Thank you so much for staying on with us, Ben. Um, is there anything about the actuarial profession in Canada that wasn't asked about that you would like to spotlight? Uh, just that uh, Canada is a kind of carries its its weight more than most countries internationally. It's a very internationally oriented company or country, and uh, so uh, both in terms of wel welcoming immigration, having lots of international students, but also exporting a lot of actuarial talent. So we have about thirteen hundred and fifty SOA members who who were trained in Canada but practice outside of Canada. So we're a net exporter of, of actuarial talent across the globe. So if you are if you love kind of that international flavor and multicultural flavor, uh, Canada is a great place to come or be. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much to everyone on the call. We have our next Angels from an Actuary on June 7th. Uh, details are not up yet, but if you want to mark your calendars for that and... Thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Likewise. Thank you. Yep. Bye, all. Bye.